Howdy, I'm Jeff Rouse. I'm a resident faculty member here at Spear Education. I'm also a prosthodontist in private practice in San Antonio, Texas, and in Seattle, Washington. Now, why would I tell you that at the beginning of a video about pediatric airway questions? The reason is twofold. First is kind of a joke that I always make, which is the word prosthodontist comes from its Greek origins, meaning I will never treat another child. It's kind of true in my practice. I do not want to be doing dentistry on children anymore. It simply is not appealing to me at all. I want to see children in my practice all the time. I want to screen them for these airway issues, and I want to become their advocate when they're dealing with the medical community. Telling me that they'll grow out of it, that's not really the answer I want to hear any longer. The second reason that I wanted to tell you about being a prosthodontist is the majority of faculty here at Spear are prosthodontists, and the concepts that we've been talking about are adult-based concepts. You know, we have this treatment planning process that has been around for a very long time where we look for identifying the problems and the etiologies of the problems, but it's beginning to change now. You see, as a prosthodontist, we were typically seeing the adult patient with wear on their teeth and erosion on their teeth, or the adult TMD patient or aesthetics patient. And we would ask, how did the damage occur and what are we going to do to fix it? All how type of mechanical questions. Today we're asking a different question. We're asking the question, why? Why did it occur in the first place? Because if you can get to the why, and the why happens to be a medical complication, you can actually end up with a patient that's healthier in the end. And we see patients like these very commonly in that situation, where the teeth have over erupted, they've got a concave gingival architecture, they're missing four bicuspids, they've got a malocclusion associated with it. We walk through the process of how to get the teeth in the right location to restore them and fix them. But when you see this, what I want you to begin seeing is where the problem came from. Where did it really begin? Because that's really the why of the whole thing. Why did it happen in the first place? And the why happens at a time when the neurocognitive, systemic, and craniofacial defects are at their utmost. Children, because of their bodies and brains are growing at such a rapid pace, they suffer the most. But to ignore the fact that the problem existed in the first place would be to assume that all these patients got healthy over time. They didn't. When you're finally dealing with them in the FGTP course, they've had the problem for a long, long time, and they're just showing the problem in a different way now. They're showing it as high blood pressure. They're showing it as a previous heart attack and high cholesterol levels. They're showing it as anxiety and depression types of issues. What we need to do is focus back on why did it happen? And it usually the why takes us back to children. Now, if you're going to start changing the practice and start focusing on children, one of the difficulties is figuring out what questions to ask to figure out pediatric airway issues. What we've done here at Spear is we've developed a pediatric questionnaire that is simple. It is 10 questions. There are some subsets of those questions. And in this video, we're going to go over all of them. Now, what have we done and how have we developed that? We've used two different sources mainly. There was this pediatric sleep questionnaire that Ron Chervin did. It's the only validated questionnaire out there. And then the, also the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry has come up with their policy on obstructive sleep apnea. But what you'll notice in both of those is it focuses on finding children that have obstruction of their airway. What I've shown you in other videos is it's also about more minor airway events that can cause problems as well. So we've added some questions to our survey to try to find the more nuanced type of patient that might be in your practice. All right, let's begin with the first two questions. And in fact, the questions are grouped in such a way that sections of questions are trying to highlight certain activities that might be related to airway issues. The first two questions relate to how does this child sleep? Can they go to sleep easily? Do they stay to sl asleep? Or are they active in bed and moving around? I show a picture of my son, Jake, and it's one of those moments as a parent, you're trying to decide whether to take the photo or taking his finger out of his nose. But it reminds me of Jake as a child. And Jake as a child was a horrible sleeper. 
He was that colicky kid, the one that you could put in his bed and he would cry and cry and cry. So you had to lay with him. But once he finally went to sleep, you had to slink out of the bed, lay on the floor, hope that he didn't wake up as you worked your way out into the hallway. And then finally, by the time you were walking back to your bedroom, he'd be saying, Dad, where are you? He's also the kid in the middle of the night that would wake up and come into your room, waking you up, snuggling into your bed. He just couldn't sleep at all. I saw it as just being the bad child, but in fact, he had airway problems all along that were eliciting these changes. I just missed it. Kids need sleep, and they need a lot more sleep than adults do. An adult can get by on six to eight hours, and in fact, some even less than that. Children need significantly more, and we've been robbing them of that time year after year, getting it less and less. They need about 10 to 12 hours of sleep, and what the data is showing is from the time I was a child till now, we've probably got an hour less in most of our children than we had before. What's the benefit of sleep and why do they need so much of it? Well, as their bodies and brains are growing, they need to recover from the day. They need the biologic and biochemical refreshment. They also need to get the immune response, get the inflammation and chronic stress out of their system. Most importantly, they're learning at this point in time, so memory is backed up during sleep, and their psychological well-being, the anxiety, the depression types of issues can be dealt with that as well. The key is they can't be moving around. One very famous neurologist said, if you're moving in bed and not paralyzed during sleep, you are simply not gaining the benefit of being asleep. Now that's the first two questions. The first two questions are about their patterns of sleep. The next two questions are looking for minor airway events, and that is mouth breathing. And we're not only gonna focus on mouth breathing at night while they're asleep, we're gonna look at it in the day as well because you can get some signs there. This is a 24-hour problem, not simply a nighttime problem. We know that depending on the survey and the question, somewhere between 10 and 25% of children, when they go to sleep, are breathing through their mouth. Now, they're not gonna be doing it all the time, but if they're doing it any of the time, we call them a mouth-breathing child. The patients that have apnea are gonna be breathing through their mouth even more than the patients without. So the apneic patient almost the entire time during the night will have their mouth open. And remember, this isn't necessarily the fat old man in the airport with their mouth wide open. This is just a cracking of the lips and allowing the air to flow through their mouth during sleep. It needs to be nasal breathing, not mouth breathing. We know that the patients that are asleep with their mouth open tend to breathe through their mouth during the day as well. About 80% of patients that are mouth breathers at night are gonna be mouth breathers during the day as well. So this is a sleep and awake problem not just a sleep issue. It simply magnifies some of the impacts while they are asleep. You've got to have your mouth closed and you've got to actually have your tongue in the roof of your mouth in order to actually grow correctly. So breathing really is the foundation for growth and development of the craniofacial system. Breathing through the nose expands the nasal cavity. The tongue in the roof of the mouth explains, expands the oral cavity and that's how we continue to grow. We know those patients that are mouth breathers are gonna grow more abnormally. The simple effort required to breathe through your mouth actually changes the position and direction of growth. The mouth being open, the teeth apart, the tongue not driving the growth will alter that growth and development as well. So when we look at the adult patient in the FGTP course, I see the kid. I see where the problem came from. This five and a half year old child has a history of snoring since birth, whether she was congested or not. She grinds her teeth all, all night long, which we've talked in other videos, could be an indication of an airway problem. Her mom highlights to me though, during these question three and question four, that her daughter has really bad breath and that she's a mouth breather, even during the day that she can't get her to close her mouth. But finally she said, but she's my good sleeper. Good sleeper to a parent means I can put them asleep and they show up the next morning still in bed. They didn't wake up during the night and cause any disturbance in the family. It doesn't mean that the child gets good sleep though. She's simply not gaining the benefit of being asleep because of the pattern of breathing that she responds to or shows us. 
She also had a long history of pacifier use, which we'll talk about later in question number 10. She wanders around the bed, meaning she's not paralyzed, gaining the advantage of being asleep. She gets a lot of ear infections that have to be treated with antibiotics, which we'll discuss is the lack of nasal breathing, driving more air through the mouth, seeding the oral cavity with bacteria. And finally, she has a lisp and an infantile swallowing pattern, which is a tongue posture and tongue positioning issue. Now, through the rest of the videos that we focus on pediatrics, we'll start talking about the examination we do and how we evaluate these patients, what we look for for airway-induced types of problems, and some of the screening tools that are used in order to identify these types of patients and know what types of treatments would be most effective for them. The first four questions deal with minor types of sleep issues, more the insomnia and mouth breathing. And what seems such a minor thing of, yes, their lips are apart and they are breathing through their mouth, can actually be an indicator of some significant disadvantages while they're asleep. Just being the good sleeper in the family doesn't mean you gain the benefit of being asleep all the time. 